Yeah, no bother, eh? Delphi, but uh, Gary, thank you so much for coming on. It's a pleasure to, to speak to you. I, I know that you're a busy guy. You've obviously got life, you've got work, you've got the band, you've got everything on the go, so I do appreciate you taking the time to, to pop on and speak to myself. But before we get started, how are you doing? Eh, I'm doing great. Um, life, life's pretty as well. Uh, for, sorry, thank you very much, Ian, for giving us the opportunity. It's, honestly, it's always great to hear we blather and, and just talk about how things come about with the band and what have you. But uh, no, life, life's good, the family's good and that, so uh, we've, uh, we've got our health, so that, that's, that's the main thing. No, that's good. Um, obviously, we've got it's the podcast, so we can, you know, it'll be a, it'll be longer. The reason I like a podcast is it's longer than interviews, so you can ask questions that don't normally get asked. You can kind of talk about things in a bit more in depth and stuff like that. So we should have a good laugh anyway. But what I normally do, Gary, is I go right back to the start for everybody. So I normally yep. I ask people, where were you? Where did you grow up? And were you into music when you were very young? Yeah, um, right at the start, I was born, uh, my, my early, my first two years were in a tenement with an outside toilet in uh, Perth, the Perth Road area, Dundee, uh, Rihal Lane. So I, I didn't really mind of that, but in uh, <laughs> 1969, I moved to the, the Whitfield Maltese, the Whitfield Housing Scheme, uh, which was rough as hell, but when you were a bairn, um, you didn't notice how rough it was. We we stayed nine up in a multi-story, and many a time the lift was broken, there was um, there was human shite and on, on the landings, it was, it was uh, an eye-opener. But honestly, for a wee toy age, uh, we were, like other bairns, we were all that out, and you went on your adventures and wonders, yeah. You wouldn't have dreamed of doing that now with, with your kids. Um, I, it, it's crazy. I mean, I, I'm obviously, I, I'm a bit younger than yourself, but even, I mean, I grew up, I think I was maybe the last generation. I got right through my teens until the internet hit. So I kind of completely grew up without the internet. Yeah. Uh, and without mobile phones and all that sort of stuff. So similar to yourself, you know, you got let out, your, your mum kicked you out the door and you were away for the day on your adventures and you came home and the streetlights came on. That, that's true. And you, come on, you made your own fun. Um, it, it's funny because you get a bit nostalgic, but I could remember loads of my childhood and and just it being fun. Um, obviously, the, the gangs was in here are the scheme gangs which eventually wrote a book later about um, the history of it yeah. but as you got a wee bit older eh, it was dodgy times going into other areas you, you had pals in different schemes yeah. um, so even just travelling over a border or a road you, you, you could have got a right kicking but like I say going back to the younger days um, you were just carefree days Wandering miles, kind of what are the parks and uh, just getting up to no good. Um, so, uh, the, sorry, the Whitfield Malt is um, 1974. We moved out of there and a Fintry where I'm, I'm still here yet, the Fintry housing scheme. Yeah. Um, and I remember the house. Mum and Dad are still along there, just along the road. Uh, just, so, Gary, see. You were a wee tiny kid. Were you into music? Was music in your house? That's something yeah. you sort of came across later on. Yeah, sorry. Um, music. My mum and dad had a, an old record player, um, and music was on in the house. I can remember it being on at the time. And yeah. the, it's funny because some some old record will come on um, on the radio or that, and you're like, it just takes you right back to being in the Maltese, and I can remember a lot of the, it's funny because I'm, I'm very interested in the Trojan ska music, uh, Desmond Decker and Toots and the Metals and that, and there was loads of the hits in the charts in 69, 70, 71, so I can remember a lot of that, and and then the glam rock came about in that, but there, there was always records on, and the, the culture in the Maltese and then when we came here, 
the New Year parties. Uh, there was always records on the the, uh, the sing songs and that, so it was a great time. I can remember my old man telling me that uh, you should go along to a New Year party and you'd have your, your records under your arm. But yeah. the only problem was that you never, if you went with 20 records, you never re- returned with 20. You, you would end up, your records would be scattered across however. <laughs> You'd end up with people's records like one of yours and, and uh, oh. all that stuff. <laughs> Any of the worst things, you, I don't care if you mind yourself, when you, when you got a new record that was your pride and joy and sometimes you'd maybe stack too many singles on, on the arm and the, the last thing on maybe nine singles, <laughs> the arm would just go scratch right over it and your, your record was knackered. It was funny, I, I remember like... Um, I was talking, my, my dad, he was really into music. That's kind of probably where I get it from. Yeah. And it, when, he was, when he was younger, he left high school when he went to, got a job in Glasgow. Right. So you're probably talking, this would have been in the late 60s, or sorry, early 70s, right? And he's saying that you would, there was a record store down in Sucky Hall Street. And he yeah. said, the coolest thing that you could do, because back then you, you didn't really have band T-shirts like, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll wear a band t-shirt now and that, you know, just because you like the band, you want people to know that you like this band, that you're supporting them. But yeah. he, he didn't have that back then, but he's saying the coolest thing you could have done back then was you would you'd go into the record store and you'd maybe sit and listen to the, the new album that's come out, but he says, see, buying that record and then you'd, you'd walk home with it under your arms. So you standing at the bus stop, everybody could see the album that you've just bought. <laughs> It's like a statement, like you were telling people, this is what I like. Oh, I definitely, yeah. I mean, when you got your pocket money in that, I can remember probably as far back as a single being about 62 pence, 65 pence. Um, yeah. And I, I remember, this is true, my dad, my dad had a wee one on the pools, coupons afford the lottery and I had was about... So I you used to try and get eight score draws and you'd win thousands of pounds, but... He won four pound fifty or something. <laughs> I said, Dad, can I get that? And I went down and got Sham sixty nine new album. That's life. So that was his pools went away. <laughs> uh, here's a question for you, Gary. Do you remember what the first single or album was? The first one you ever bought with your own money? Yes, and um, I'm no proud to admit this. The first uh, <laughs> the first single I bought was. The Bee Gees tragedy. <laughs> it was a tragedy. Um, and then the, the next thing after that was uh, 999 Homicide. So, like I say, I, I grew up, honestly, I loved music. I loved um, I the, the glam rock and that uh, was always on in the house. What and about, what, uh, you remember, what, the, what was the first concert that you ever went to? It's funny because with me and the mates, well, I got into punk rock probably in 1978. I can remember Sham 69 coming on the top of the pops. And it, like, mum and, mum and dad listened to the Beatles, the Stones and all. And, um, but I remember uh, Sham 69 coming on doing Hurry Up Harry. And I was like, I like that. And, and that was it for then. And other mates, we were at it and we'd go down to the community centre just down the road, like you say, with your vinyl. And very quickly you were collecting, as soon as you got your pocket money, you were at the record shop. Funny you're saying, you're saying Top of the Pops there as well, because I don't think people, I mean, obviously it's not a thing nowadays, but I don't think people realise how big an impact that had, because you didn't have YouTube and all that. You could, couldn't you just go and access any music band or video. So that was like this wee sort of world where you could discover new stuff. And somebody I was talking to on a previous episode, they were saying, you know, they, they were saying that they were really into pop music, but they were saying not the pop music that you would hear on the radio today. He said pop music way back in the sort of late 70s, early 80s, it yeah. was completely different to what it is now. I mean, back then it was actual bands. You know, it wasn't like this sort of the pop star that you think of nowadays. Uh, so it, it has changed over time. Yeah. The, the, that was that. I mean, Top of the Pops, 
obviously it was watched by millions of people and uh, the, that was the big thing on a Thursday evening. You, you tuned in and you were hoping that you'd, you'd see some of your favourite bands come on if they'd went up the charts and that. Um, and it, it was massive. But you, you were asking, the first concert I went to, um, I was 13 year old in 1980 and yep. uh, Stuff Little Fingers were playing in the Caird Hall. So uh, uh, my mum and dad weren't going to go, well, especially my mum wasn't going to let us go because uh, the, 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 there was a lot of aggro at the punk gigs back then. I mean, I, I was still young. So the yeah. sun's shining, I know. A trend uh, bought that out. Um, yeah, the, the, the punk gigs, there, there was a lot of aggro in that back in the day. So, oh, jeez. Uh, 1980, it was Stiff Little Fingers and the wall were supporting. Um, and I, I'll, I'll never forget it, but it was just all wee things like asking for your first pair of Doc Merton bets and that. Your mum's like, ah, oh, you think you're a wee hooligan and that. But it was just the fashion. We, we loved it and we were lucky because our mates were into it. And now you go, oh, you've got a skinhead. Nah, my hair just fell out, but it looks cool. Aye, <laughs> well... That, that's the thing, Ian. See, see back then, I mean, we, we were into punk rock, but we always say that there was so much music uh, genres in that, and fashions, that was, it was huge, the fashion. So, you, you could have been into heavy metal, uh, ska, um, yeah. reggae, pop music, punk, and, and skinhead. So, just probably about 82, I started getting a, a crew cut and get the bleach jeans and the the, the braces and all that and, and got into that kind of music but it, it wasn't any racist crap it, it was just the fashion and we loved the, the punkier side of it but the ska music and that I loved all that but you wouldn't to admit to your mate to like some ska music or pop music <laughs> funny that you say uh, stiff little fingers I'm trying to get um, one of them to come on my, my friend is, is friends with the guitarist so I'm kind of chasing him up, see if I can get, get him to come on as well. Is that Hen Henry Clooney? I can't even remember which, uh, which one it is, but uh, my pal has been friends with him for years. And uh, every time they're playing at the Barrowlands, they always go out for drinks beforehand and that. So I'm going right. to be him saying, right, can you pass, pass, me up, pass on my details to him because I'm wanting him to come on the show and, and uh, chat away oh. Music and that, but uh, obviously, Gary, you're playing, um, you're playing the bagpipes, and you're singing. So, was the were the pipes your first instrument as well? Yeah, you came what in. Uh, honestly, I wasn't a musical at all. Um, I didn't have a clue. Like, didn't have an ear for music. Didn't kind of read music. So, I was, I was probably lit in terms of starting playing the pipes at um, the age of nineteen. And just down the road, the, the Fintry Pipe Band used to practice. And I used to go down to my grand's, gran and granddad's, and I'd hear the pipes, and I was like, I fancy learning them. So I went to one, and sadly, yesterday, the old pipe major, uh, Richie Wa, taught us the pipes. He, he passed away, so that was his funeral yesterday. But a, a great person spent the time with me and loads of other people learning with uh, how to play a musical instrument. Yeah. And like I say, it wasn't a musical at all, so that, it was about a year on the chanter, and then I got a set of pipes, and uh, <laughs> there's so much going on with the pipes, to learn the tune, marching time, get the bag up. And, and yeah. I, but eventually, after a year, I got it. Uh, I, I was wondering if it was maybe Bon Scott that had, had inspired you. No, it's funny because um, I was in the Fintry Pipe Band, which Ed, Ed left them by then, but they eventually went to the Olympic Games in Beijing in 2008. And yeah. I was so proud of them. I was like, are we banned for this Houston scheme yeah. on, on the Olympics? So, no, I was in the, the Pipe Band and had some great shows and carry-ons, but I, I wasn't until later working in the NCR factory, um, I'd, I'd started doing street, what you call street poetry, um, just doing poems in my own dialect. I didn't care where that comfy. 
And and then that evolved into Stevie, the bass player, was still in the Cundies now. He, yeah. he was already in bands by his days. So this is what about trying to put um, poetry to music with, with his band? Yeah. Kind of like John Cooper Clark and that. So we gave it a wee bash and, and that was kind of the start of that. And because I was playing the pipes, we just gave that a try later on and, and away we went. Basically, you're like a you're like a Scottish Jim Morrison. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care about that. Maybe some sometimes I'm as daft as him. Eh? <laughs> uh, but uh, obviously, if, see if you if you fast forward, the Cundies did they start around two two thousand and ten sort of time? Ian, we started in two thousand and seven um, yeah. as a, a, I wouldn't say well, it was it a Dundee United band? Um, I, I do the foot. I, I know that you obviously were doing the sort of football songs for them. That's kind of how it started. Yeah, definitely. Um, like I say, would would give this wee thing a try. It was, it was doing some of the poems along to the the music with the boys, and then we, me and Stevie says, "What about writing a new song for Dundee United?" Because there was it's united in that there was there were songs like that so we says what we doing a kind of punky uh, Dundee United song so Stevie got his his pal Alec Geddes the guitarist for um, PSV the band they were in and uh, we used to drink in the 4Js doing beside Tanadice and we were drinking there and some guy says Tez over there plays the drums <laughs> so I can hear you <laughs> Right, you're playing drums on this. So, I wrote the words. Um, we come up with a melody and we, we wrote a, quite a good catchy punk song about Dundee United. Yeah. And uh, and that was that was going to be a... Because, um, like I say, it wasn't, a band, it wasn't in bands or anything. Steve was doing his own thing. Yeah. But we, we enjoyed it. So, we started just writing and a lot of the stuff... We, we wrote a few of our own numbers like that first thing uh, Totally United it was called but the we, we started re, I started rewriting loads of the old punk classics the, the Buzzcock Sham 69 and changed yes. the words that had uh, Dundee United orientated and and that was that we had some mental gigs with United fans but yeah. we used to get a lot of shit for the Dundee fans because when when you're doing fuck Purely football, it's you, you, you're dividing your audience and can what well, like I say, what's some great gigs for the Dundee United fans? But eventually, we, we wanted to be writing more stuff and and moving in a different direction. Aye, I mean, I I've I played the pubs for the last fifteen years now, just just as a way of making some extra money. Eh? And uh, I just compl- I completely avoid the the request. Or football songs because it's yeah, especially Rangers or Celtic. It's just going to cause problems for you, depending on which one you you pick. Obviously, I follow a team, but to me, I just keep it completely separate because it's it's more hassle than it's worth. But yeah. uh, but for yeah. yourself, kind of, the band kind of got together through Dundee United, but from there it then progressed on to be fun doing this. Let's start writing our own songs, kind of thing. Yeah, that that was it. Ian, we were we were still doing the Dundee United stuff, and then we started creeping in a few the po- poems that I'd written, like Scheme Life and that. Um, yeah, and we, we put music to it, and we were really enjoying that. And we we eventually made the decision that that's where we've got to go with it because sticking with the football stuff was was alienating with for a lot of people. Um, so. We, we just went on a writing mission and that was it. So Gary, t- tell us who's in the band. Talk us through who's in the band. The the lineup right now, the only originals is myself and Stevie McCall, the bass player. Right. Um, we 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 come up with the idea way back in the NCR factory and and, and that was how it, it started. Uh, but the the lineup just now is uh, Trotsky. Um, he. Him, him and Stevie played for years in, in punk bands, uh, plastic surgery and that, Dundee bands. 
um, Sean Kerr's on the drums and Sean, Stevie and Trotsky were all played together so it's been funny they've, they've come around full circle and they're back together again yeah. and we've got um, my mate for scale John or Jock he gets called he, he uh, he's like the best of the band <laughs> he just that, that's, about and that's he's, off and he's, the one, uh, he's the one that's the, that's the dancer that's putting on the moves Yes, um, and come what's funny, we were playing uh, the O2 at Scotland Colin just the weekend there. Yeah. The first time we got a shout for it, it was back in 2015, I think. So it was a big deal for us. We're like, even though we were on early doors, we're like, this is a step up. And John, John come on stage, he wasn't kind of, he wasn't invited into the band at that time, he was just roadie. And he come on with all these fancy dress things. He was on and off. It was, it was like a joke, Ken. And we're like, you, you can't be doing that. Um, so he, he got a tell enough, but he's a, he's a good laugh. Me and him go way back. So he plays the tambourine and that now. I was watching a lot of your stuff stuff today. And there's one thing you do on stage, which I really like. You look like you are actually on stage enjoying yourself. See the many bands that I watch and they might sound just as good as the album. They might sound even better than the album. Yeah. But they look like they wish they were anywhere but on stage in front of people. And it, it blows my mind. If I'm on stage, you want to be, you, if you're not having fun, what's the point in doing it? Yeah, correct. Um, honestly, we, we've had gigs in the past. We, we used to do a lot of gigs, not so much now, but... Um, the, the times were you could have filled a phone box <laughs> but we always always go out and enjoy the show and, and we're like if, if there's only one man and his dog here then we'll treat it as a good rehearsal and, and we'll hear we laugh we, uh, always always enjoy yourself I always think if, if the band's having fun then the audience is going to have fun yeah. watching and that, that's the way it is but see for yourselves right so you're obviously quite established now with with the setup of the band how do you go about writing a song so for example we'll use me up in your rehearsal space and we'll use just right who's got any ideas or do, does somebody come with an idea already kind of made up and everyone contributes to it how, how what's the normal setup for you guys can, can what Ian it, 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 it's like a a conveyor belt it, it moves in different ways it's a real strange thing. There's, there's no set way that we do it. Um, sometimes, well, what we've always done, we've always rehearsed on a Thursday, whether we've got shows or no. We, we just go down and we're, we're really lucky that other boys get on like good pals and we socialise together as well. So so it's not just coming together for the band and, and forget. Um, but... Sometimes we could be in the studio before we start rehearsing and, and Trotsky will start rattling up a riff. <laughs> and we're like, keep playing that. Nice. So the great, the great thing with phones and that now, you, you can just record that right away. And it, honestly, I've got a phone full of wee ideas, the riffs. Uh, so there's that kind of thing. Or sometimes um, I'll get an idea for a song. I'll, I'll just write the verses and choruses. Uh, chorus. And we'll go doing, and the boys will come up with some melody to put it together. Or sometimes I'll hear melody myself mm. um, and, and put it to the words. So you're coming doing, and the boys will, will add in that. So oh. it, it really is different at the time. Sometimes they'll hear a good tune, and they'll say, right, I'll, I'll go and get words for that. Yeah, I mean, the beauty, the beauty of it is, is that there's not a right or a wrong way. If, if a good song is the end result. That's really all that matters. Yeah, that that's true. And the, we've we've come up with some ideas in the past, and and what the end product has been when we record it was quite different from what it started life. So it's it's great. And and we shown on the drums now. Um, he's very creative as well. And other other guys all hear an input into the the process. So, it, can, it's not just left down to one or two people. How, how do, you, do you go about recording as a band? So, do you go into the studio 
And do you, does the rhythm section record live? And do you do overdubs, or do you just start from the very bottom by recording the drums first, bass, guitars, and so on? How, how do you go about recording? Yeah, come on, we we love going into the the studio. Where where we're rehearsed, Graham Graham Watt at Seagate Studios is an absolute musical genius. His his ear for music is phenomenal, and yeah. and yeah, so. We'll, we'll go in, we'll, we'll do the song that we're going to do or an instrumental, whatever, and that's where the drums will get laid down first. The, so we've, we've got that. So then we we'll sometimes either go into the studio where Graham's got a, the, the mixing desk or he'll do it through the, the rehearsal but he, and he'll, he'll tack Stevie's bass um, get that recorded. Sometimes the drums and Stevie will, will be okay if, if they're if they've no made any mistakes. Then that's what that will be. Uh, then Trotsky will, will do a, a rhythm guitar or the melody, and then he'll do overdubs, uh, we add-ons, and and just beef the sound up. And and it's great. Uh, yeah. And, and then the, the, the vocals all come last. Aye. Do you do you enjoy the recording process? Do you, do you like creating something from nothing? Or is it more of a, we have to record these songs in order to get them out there to then play live? Do you, or, or do you like the process of actually recording? Yeah, definitely. We, we just love um, making music. I mean, there's sometimes... We'll, we'll no come up with anything for a while, but we we'll honestly didn't go out our way to to say right. We we'll better get someone out, someone new. We we've just been lucky that sometimes we've come in threes and fours, brand new songs, and, and <laughs> sometimes we'll, we'll maybe do a new album. Can we've got an album's worth and we'll record it? And we're like, right, we're not doing any new stuff. Um, let's let's play this. <laughs> Somebody will come up with an idea and we've got a brand new one and, and next thing it's getting played live on stage. So we we really do love recording, but we never feel a necessity that we need to keep putting stuff out. Yeah. Do you, ever, do you ever come across that thing where when you're recording, say you're recording 10 songs yeah. for an album, you become really close to those 10 songs because you're hearing them getting built every step of the way. So you know the songs inside out. And it's it's funny how if you're recording 10 songs, there'll be two of them that you think to yourself, these are going to go down great live. There's, just, there's something about them that this is going to go down great. And it doesn't always work that way that you go and play them live and, and it might be another two that you were not expecting. That yeah. some, for some reason the crowd latches on to them, but the two that you thought were going to be great are almost like fillers. It, it, yeah. it works and how it connects with different people. Yeah, it's it, it's funny how like you you usually hit an idea of what what ends are the bangers as you would say and um, can the ends that people will enjoy, and and then sadly it, the reality is that quite a few of the tracks on an album will. I'll be fillers, but well, we've done six albums now. We're working on a seventh just now, so there's loads of material. But yeah. we, we'll still go back and pull one or two of the first album and that, um, oh. chuck it into the set, depending on what kind of crowd it is. But the, there's definitely tracks that we'll love, but they'll stay as album tracks. And what about like? So this is kind of going back to our conversation from earlier, but. Nowadays, the way that people access music, you know, you can stream it online, you can download it, you can get it on YouTube and all these other sort of platforms. Now, similar to yourself, when, when I was younger, you would go to a music shop when they still existed, right? Yeah. And you'd go in, you'd be clicking through the records or the CDs. I've seen myself buy an album, having never heard the band, having never heard the songs simply based on that is a cool album cover. Yeah. Um, that, right? So, so to me, artwork is is really, really important, but there, there will be a whole generation of people that 
it's almost irrelevant because why do you need artwork when you're streaming it? Is art? Do you think artwork's still important? Do you care what? I loved, I loved the vinyl, especially the albums and that. And like you say, singles or uh, albums, the the work that went into some of the covers was was amazing. And then you'd maybe be lucky and there'd be a wee inner sleeve, you'd get some extra. Um, yeah. But you, you're spot on there. The the cover would jump out at you. And it was the same. I'd, I'd go into record shops and you, you'd just be flicking through them and, and you would buy them, go him. Usually they were they were good, but <laughs> once in a blue moon, you're like, that's right at the back of the pile. That's never going to see the light of day. But uh, uh, the album covers were always cool. I I feel it, it'd be a shame if it if it if that part of it disappeared because that to me is still so important from the visual side of things. Yeah, album cover is just a cool album cover, and also you can then use it for your T-shirt and other, yeah. other bits of merchandise and stuff like that as well. But um, obviously, that's talking about the recording side of things. Um, obviously, you love playing live. Why why would, why would you not? But uh, which one do you prefer? Do you prefer recording or do you prefer playing live? If you had to pick just one of them. Oh, <laughs> oh. oh that's hard. Uh, I, I think it's got to be playing live because you make a connection and th there's nothing better than marking a racket and people come up after and say, oh, that, that was really good. Can, yeah. Not everybody's going to enjoy what what we do or what other bands do, but it's it's just good to, you can put a smile on some faces and yeah. people enjoy it. And like you say earlier, we always try and go and enjoy ourselves on stage and you hopefully that, that, you hope that feeds back across to the audience and can just hear a bit of banter and that. It's funny though, is music, it's such a, it's such a good thing though and it is true that you know, it doesn't matter what problems you've got going on in your life or, you know, you could be side by side with somebody in completely different backgrounds, but just for that one hour, nobody cares. It's just about the music having a good time and that, that's the great thing about yeah. it. Uh, but, uh, all the you've, been, you've been playing for a while now, Gary, but do you still get nervous before you go on stage? Every time, honestly. Yeah. Every time, um, it, in different degrees, it can like if, if we're doing it Rebellion Festival in Blackpool, it's it's a big deal and fantastic. Can professional set up with uh, the sound and that the guys yeah. the guys know their stuff and really look after you. But when, uh, when there's a lot of people coming to see you and you you just don't want to mark an air or something, but. Uh, <laughs> Sometimes you forget the words and forget a wee tune and that, but you just crack on. But you do get nervous. I was going to say, I'm assuming it's a, it's a good kind of nervous because yourself and the other lads that are in the band, you know that everybody is capable of doing their part yeah. to make that performance good, but you obviously all want to go out there and have a good time. I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not playing festivals of that, but I find myself, I still get... I'll still get nervous, but it's more about things a little bit out with my control. So I'll get nervous that I hope it's a good sound through the day or, you yeah. know, something. I, I know that the minute I get out there and I hit the first chord, I, I'm fine. I know that I'm capable of playing the song on the guitar and singing the part. Yeah. I get so nervous about things out with my control, but I'm guessing that's probably quite quite normal for, for a lot of people. Oh, definitely. I mean, you, you can yourself be playing live and uh, things go wrong. And I, m I remember a gig in Edinburgh. <laughs> oh, the, mics, the mics were going off, so I'm going along with the, the other mic. He's that mic. And the, the, the sound guy actually walked out that night. He just <laughs> lost the plot and just couldn't get the sound. But like that, you just crack on and uh, try and get through it. Yeah. But, uh, so I was going to say... Well, it's, it's off put in there when, when the sound, especially if you kind of hear through the monitors and that, and you're like, and I think it's only just we rehearsing a lot that sometimes you, you're, you're going on instinct and we can where we are. Yeah, plus you'll be able to read the other guys in the band. You'll know 
what they're about to do, especially like your, your drummer and bass player and that, they'll be able to keep it going. Uh, yes. If some, something sh- turns up and you need to improvise on the spot, you know that they've got it. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's been a few things, Kim, and maybe playing a tune on the pipes and you totally make a mock-up of it. <laughs> Guys are like... But uh, you, you just keep going and you get there. Uh, these these things you, happen. I'll tell you what, Gary, there's a, there, you can get away with a lot of things with a bit of confidence as well. Aye, that, that's that. I mean, you, you just keep smiling and maybe make a wee comment after it. Just say, oh, that, that's a new version we've written or something like that. It's but, funny though, because seeing the amount of times something will happen and you, you guys will come off stage and you will talk be, amongst yourselves. Yeah. But if you were to ask anybody in the audience, they probably never even noticed the mistake. However, they would have noticed it had you stopped or made a big deal oh, about it. Yeah. Going, confidence gets you by so much stuff. That That is very true. I mean, I've, I've been... We've been at some venues where uh, there's been a few bands on and I remember a couple in particular just stopping because they'd, they'd made a muck-up. And you're like, oh, no, it... Just keep going and you blag your way through it, you'll get there. As it, Fred Mercury said, the show must go on. That's it, definitely. I mean, it, it just, it's a real showstopper, it's horrendous. If, if you stop dead and uh, Abdi's like, whoa. Yeah. No, you just got to keep going. <laughs> I know. So, so, Gary, Saturday the 25th of May, we've got Pete and Diesel's Black Isle Belter. How did you get roped into that? How, how did that come about? Well, I think anybody that kens me and <clears throat> maybe sees social media and that, uh, I stumbled onto Pete and Diesel, like many others, like yourself and that. Uh, it was 2019 for me. Yeah. We were, we were over in Sky climbing up in the Coolins and um, any of the, the local guys that I used to speak to on Twitter, uh, he says, oh, Pete and Diesel are playing up in Portree. And I was like, what are these guys? And she says, oh, they're kind of Celtic punk kind of thing. <laughs> so we, we, got, we got steaming and we never, we never made it to Portree. So when I, went, when I got him to Dundee on the Sunday, I said, like, I'm going to check this lot out. Um, so the Western Isles video we boyed in that was, was on YouTube. And right. for that, I was like, these guys are someone else, uh, and I just went looking for anything they were doing, and and just be there. It snowballed, and um, eventually going seeing them, and we I says we're going to write a song for you called Pete and Diesel, and and then we've done a cover of Horo Yali and that. We we probably yeah. done about four or five songs <laughs> mentioning the guys. It was a real phase of um, really they, they just grabbed me especially. And, I was like, this is something so fresh and new. Can chuck their music, but we are butter balls. Like, I think it's nice to it's nice to see a Scottish band doing well, not just within Scotland, but I mean outside of Scotland as well. Yep. And I think I think that's a Scottish thing. You just get behind them, and you know, it doesn't almost to the point. It doesn't matter if you if. If you if you don't like the music, it's just great to see someone doing so well. But the three of them are are, are doing great, and and they're going from strength to strength. I had I had really the drummer on. All oh, right, aye. Uh, however many episodes ago, and I've got Ennis coming on soon. Oh, brilliant! Eh? As well, so it's cool talking to them. But obviously, you are playing there on Saturday the twenty fifth. Um, have you? Have you crossed paths with Rumac yet? Yeah, oh, uh, <laughs> he's off, he's not. Um, when when I went to, obviously the pandemic come in and stopped a load of stuff. So there was meant to be an Ireland trip and what the, the boys had organised was a, a 52-seater. Or oh, other fans that were really into the band and you, you paid to go on this trip and... and see them all over Ireland. Yeah. So that got uh, cancelled, I think it was three times. So eventually it came around and uh, Rumac was supporting us through it. So we went to uh, Belfast, Galway, Dublin and Cork 
<laughs> what a carry on that was. Um, I'm surprised my liver's still working. But, uh, I mean, leading up to that, I'd, I'd got really friendly with the, the guys and just, like I said, that someone touched me with their music and their attitude and all that. Uh, I, I just, honestly, I still can't get enough of it. But, yeah, to, to be a... To be able to actually get friends with the guys, and I've heard Boydie Stein at the house here for a week, and oh, what well, a right carry on. I think it's that thing, probably because that. I mean, I, I don't obviously know them, but they come across as very normal as well. Definitely, yeah. Um, but it's, it's nice to see. It's like normal people achieving something that's really, really good. It, it, that that's why why you want them to do well. Because they're just not, they look like normal guys like you and me. Yeah. And I, I think that. Ah, the, it's a bit mental. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they've, they've, they've always said right from the start, they were like, how the hell did this happen? You know, three guys for Stornoway. And it, it's so good to, pardon me, see them like for the start. I mean, I didn't catch them right at the start. They were, they were on the go doing the, the pubs in Stornoway and that. But. Yeah. To see the, the meteoric rise, and I mean, they've, they've got a spot on We um, Beyond Presents looking after them and proper management and that, so it, it's great because they, they've got someone that you could play in a pub, but they can also play at massive festivals and that. It, it's just, and it, it's just feel good music. When when you're doing it at the front there, or even at the back, older people, up these jigging, it's, it's yeah. just. Uh, just to feel good, yeah. I, I, I've saw them three times now in the last last year and a half. Yeah. And it's amazing because it, it, it was three very different gigs. Yeah. So it's, not, it's not just... They've got this ability to, to still bring something different each time. They're not, it's not just a rehash of the previous gig. You know, so they're, they're playing different songs. But it, not even that. I mean, it, it, they just... You the stayed full and bits and pieces that they'd done, people that they had coming out. It was something a bit different. Rumac, he was there. That's the, uh, the last time I seen him was at the Barrowlands. Right, uh, yeah. Guy was metal, but I had him on the pod podcast uh, last week, so his episode is out on Sunday coming. All oh, right, come on. I'm, I'm going to catch up with him, are you there? Because you have some characters on, aye. Aye. So his, he, he's some character, but obviously. You've got the, the Pete and Diesel Festival at, at the end of this month. You said that you're recording a new album. What else have you got planned for 2024, or is it pretty much try and get the album finished? Yeah, well, like I said, we, we said we wouldn't have gone right new stuff, but they've just been creeping up, and, and, and then we're like, well, we're not far off of hearing 10 or 11 songs or that tune, so... Yeah, we're, we're going to keep going with that kind of process. And I mean, there's no, honestly, there's no many gigs, no like we're used to. Sometimes we'd be out Friday, Saturday, sometimes three gigs in a weekend and that. But it's it's nice now. If, if we get invited to do something, um, we, we'll go and do it. But one one thing I was going to just touch on with you, Ian, um, we, we actually pulled out a gig and... Um, Guilford back in April and it really was doing to the, the cost of travelling that now wasn't it was, it wasn't it weighing up with what we were getting for doing the gig and we were going to be quite a bit out of pocket and we were meant to be we've, we've not even announced it yet but I'm going to say it anyway we were meant to be playing in Germany at the end of June and I told the guys this is look Probably my own fault, but I mean, we didn't have management, we've only looked after our own stuff. Yeah. But I said to the guy, I've grossly underestimated the cost to it, and we were getting a fee, but what it was costing us to, to go over and above was a oh, way, way out, and we're like, no, we can't do this. So there's, there's that kind of thing as well, but it, I mean, it, it's not always like that, and we, we have never been in the game for making any money. We we just love playing. Most of the time, we've been out of pocket with what we spend at the bar. 
But that's what we love. We, we love mixing with Aberdeen and, and just playing. Well, well, it's going to be interesting hearing these new songs, right? Because I was listening to you today, right? right? And I always like to listen to folks' music and, and I try and think in one head or, you know, who does it sound like? Who, who Try and hear the influences. You guys are all over the place, but in yep. a good way, right? I so, can't, I can't, uh... I was listening, right? Kills on, taps off, right? Yeah. I don't know who recorded your guitars, but you had the Metallica guitar sound on that. <laughs> I, I was like jealous. I was like, I want that sound on my guitar. That That's the sound that every rock musician is after, right? But uh, I don't know if you've, if you've heard of a guy from America called Andrew W.K. No, no, you no. No, but he does, it's like, it's like party music, and I was like, this is like part Scottish party music, but with big Metallica crunchy guitars. I was, I was, I was loving it, right? But then I put put on Piper's uh, uh, Trench Town. Have you heard of a band, a, a, an Irish band called Therapy? Eh, I've, I've not listened to them much here, but I can't what they are. Eh? Still on the go, but they came out late, late. late. Musically, it sounds it sounds like that, and then see the minute the pipes hit, it just gives it that Scottish flavour. It's brilliant. Yeah. Scheme Can you life. Sorry, on you go. Sorry, I was going to say scheme life. It's just like I was like, this is like madness. Uh. But um, <laughs> there's that Scottish bit to it, right? But see, uh, even your t-shirt, oi oi, cock the reject. Oh god, well, right? I'm listening to that, and I'm like, this sounds like. Now, this sounds like old, old Iron Maiden from like the, the late 70s. Yeah. With like Bad Religion or something like that. It was like a, <laughs> a, a sort of a combination. And then obviously the pipes jump in and it just gives it that unique sound that's different from everything else. But uh, it just shows you there's so many different influences popping in there. Now, that, that is just me listening to it. Uh, obviously, you will probably be influenced differently. It, come on, it, it, it's great to hear somebody like your Celian was obviously a musician in that, and it, it's always nice to hear people maybe dissect it and whether whether they like it or no, can just nice to hear their take on it. But you're right, I mean, when I was wee, well, younger, it was the, the punk music and that that I started, but like going back, I've always listened to music, and and even now I, I love reggae, ska, folk music, can anything really. I mean, sometimes people laugh at my playlist and Abba and Ah and on it. I, I love it. Anything. It's Gary, all these Gary, things come through. Gary, a good song is a good song. Simple as that. Yeah, yeah. It's the but someone that's I've, good on it here. Uh, yeah, I was, I was going to say, Gary, we've obviously been quite serious up to this point, quite technical. Check that. So, before we end things, I'm going to I'm going to ask you some fun questions to end things on. Right. Okay. Right. So, imagine that you could uh, jump back in time. You could go anywhere in the world. What's the one concert that you wish that you could have attended and witnessed? Oh God! Oh, there'd be loads. Eh? Come on, I'm, I would probably hate to be the Sex Pistols right, right at the start, before, before they'd even went master. Just, just to be there when it was starting. Um, it, it would probably be that. Uh, or, oh, there's so many. Yeah, maybe, maybe uh, sensational Alec Harvey or something. Um, yeah. yeah so what about- what about then, uh, as you know, there is millions and millions of amazing, great songs that have been written over the years by different bands and, and musicians. What's the one song that you wish that you could have been sat in the recording studio to witness it being recorded? Oh, that's some question. No, uh, um, <laughs> come on, I'm, I'm going to stick with the, the pistols and just... Anarchy in the UK, or the whole the Bollocks album. Um, yeah. I, I would have loved to have been just sitting through that process with you boys. Now, here, here's a question for you then. 
Imagine it's four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> You've got a dead body in the boot of your car. <laughs> you need someone to help dispose of it. No questions asked. Which band member are you help, is helping you out? Which band member are you phoning up to help you? <laughs> That's easy. That'd be Jock. <laughs> <laughs> Partner in crime. Uh, <laughs> no questions asked. It's a bad thing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> come on, Ian, it's funny, just very quickly, going back to that, that kind of thing, I mean, when we, we started getting the crew cuts and that, you, you've got to remember back in that time, I mean, the, the, the hearing that haircut instantly labelled you as a thug or a hooligan. Because now it's very natural. Um, I mean, people were hate, still hearing comb-overs and that to try and hide the baldness. But to, to hear these haircuts back in the day was was pretty um, radical, Ken. Does, anyway, does that mean, sorry, it was a one on the side step there. Is, is that you insinuating that you've possibly disposed of a dead body already somewhere? Uh, I can't stay on this programme. <laughs> right. you know, you uh, know. Gary, last question for you, Gary. Uh, Mount Rushmore, who is the four bands or musicians for yourself are at the top of the pile? Oh, God. Top of the pile. Okay, what? Well, um... I, I love the Beatles. I'm, I'm going to admit that. that. That might be pure out the box, but I, I love just the way it went for them. Um, I mean, rock and roll music was, was coming, me Chuck Berry and all, all that, but I think the Beatles sound and, and the creativity, the, the musicianship that they guys... Um, eh. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to get heckled for that, but I, I would hear them up there. So you just going with the four Beatles? Uh, probably the sex part. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, 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 and we'll do Pete and Diesel as well. <laughs> oh, I, I, you can what? I'll, when we're finished here, I'll, I'll go off and I'll be like, I should have said that and that. But I uh, get Pete and Diesel up there and that. Uh, there we go. Right, Gary. Thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. And. Uh, I'm going to follow you on social media, but I do look forward to everything that the band has got to offer in the future, and I wish you all the success. And uh, until next time, we'll, we'll meet up at a gig at some point, I'm sure. Oh, definitely. Ian, thank you so much for, for hearing a blether and spending a Friday night. And uh, Definitely, we'll meet up and, and hear a proper blether and maybe a couple of wee, a pair of teeth. But of course, thank you. Thank you so much. No bother. Cheers, Gary. Thank Cheers. you. See you. See you, brother. Thank you.